Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor, a new tutorial every week. And this week we are doing daffodils. Ah. We have Michael who's working the camera. Hello. And we will be doing this project in five steps. So our very first step, we are going to be doing a light wash on our flowers. Our second step, we'll be doing a light wash on our stems and our leaves. Our third wash, we will be putting in our medium values across the entire painting. Our fourth step, we will be putting in our dark values. And then the very last step is details. So this project, we're kind of going more for a realistic feel. We will be building up our values and creating our form through building up those values. And this is a more traditional approach to how um, you would approach a watercolor painting by light values first and then building up from there. Sarah Lorraine Cray. Yes. Let's say I'm a llama in llama land. And I'm like kind of new and I'm just cruising around the Facebook, or sorry, the YouTube. Yeah. And I want something simple. Would you say that it's bad to correlate less steps with simple? Does the step number affect the difficulty of the project? Step number does not necessarily affect the difficulty of the project. Um, because sometimes the amount of steps have to do with how full a painting is. You know what I mean? Like if there's background and foreground and midground, automatically there's going to be more steps that way because we're trying to do this full painting. So I wouldn't necessarily correlate steps with difficulty. Um, and I'm trying to think of what a good indicator of difficulty would be. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, you guys, because we all have preferences to what we enjoy painting and that can inform us of like if we have a tendency towards a specific style for example if you like structure and layers and more realistic then projects with outlines are a great way to introduce yourself to watercolors like the daffodil this would be a good one if you enjoy that kind of structure um, but I will say that because it's a little bit more realistic, it could be seen as more difficult. Now, if you have a tendency to like looseness, you like freedom, you like kind of like, yes, people can give you directions, but you're going to do what you want anyway, which is a fabulous, also a fabulous way to learn, then maybe the Citrus Grove tutorial that I did a little bit earlier in the month would be better for you to try. All I say, excuse me, my voice is going away, but just pick a project and start and then if that project is not the one for you and you don't enjoy it pick a totally different one because maybe how i approached that painting and taught that painting is um, not lined up with how you want to learn and that's totally okay but we have so many different tutorials so i would say just jump right in just jump right in and try it my f i will okay i would recommend the carrots one probably as one of the first ones to tackle because it's just fun it's and just pretty. fun it's pretty it's vibrant it's loose but you could do structure if you want but that's a personal preference of mine though. pretty and fun like me yes <laughs> <laughs> okay we are using two paintbrushes in this project we have a round six and a round two these are our go-to brushes so if you're planning on painting with us a lot i highly recommend these however you can use whatever you have um, we are using four colors for this project so our very first color is lemon yellow. Our second color is tiger orange. Our third color is rose red. And our last color is azure blue. And these are dandelion panko paints. They're our in-house paint company. Um, if you're using Dr. P.H. Martin, you can use lemon yellow, tiger yellow, um, scarlet, and Norway blue. If you have like Daniel Smith or other two paints, you kind of just are looking for yellows, red, and blue. Okay. All right. Let's do our outline, and then we'll do our oath, and then we'll get into the lesson. So. I have my outline, I taped it down to my watercolor paper. I'm gonna take my graphite paper and put it in dark, shiny side down. Is there a pencil by you? <laughs> or a pen in that cup? Felt? Yeah, that would work. Ready? Yep. Yeah. 
Did you guys see that catch? <laughs> now, why would you use a felt tip pen? Okay, so when you're tracing, how soft the tip of whatever tool you're using to trace will affect how dark the line is that shows up. So if you want it to be a dark, really dark line, use like a ballpoint pen. If you use a felt tip pen, because it just has a soft tip naturally, it's going to trace lighter on your paper than if you were to use a ballpoint. So if you're feeling frustrated with that graphite paper and how dark that line is, try using a felt tip marker pen instead. Those pens remind me of my mother. She had those growing up and I would always steal them and ruin them on accident and she would get mad. So really? I push the tips too hard. <laughs> Tombow pens are great for lettering also. Well, that's what I was going for. You know, I was really into lettering. You were practicing your lettering? Yeah. Is that too light for the overhead camera? Uh, if no, it is, it's fine. I can press darker. It's fine. Press darker if you can, but. Press harder, I mean. I'm taking up your vibe. And you just follow the lines. That's it. Now you'll notice that I have some hash marks on this outline and that's kind of where there's like crisscrosses. And I do that to show where there's going to be a darker value or a shadow. Um, you do not have to trace those onto your painting. I do that more as a reference for you guys. At first, like originally when I made outlines, I would just kind of do a hard edge line of where there were shadows but I realized that that can then become confusing between like where is the edge of the form and where is the shadow. So I tried to switch it up for you guys so um, it's a little bit more clear what's what. Um, let me know if that's helpful, actually. Um, I try and keep with that rule, but if you guys prefer the hard edges, let me know. I just realized that like by doing hard edges for your shadows, you're putting like a you would be putting like a line through the middle of your painting and I don't want it to uh, feel blocky. So that was the whole thought behind it. I only know this from video games, but it would look like cell shading. Hmm. Do you know that style? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I feel like they outline shadow, they outline everything. Yeah. And outlines are helpful because they're an easy way to communicate form. Um, but what outlines tend to do is they tend to flatten because outlines actually are basically the space between a form ends and another form begins. So it's like you don't have to do the work to like... Um, transition. Transition that value to communicate that this form is ending and another one is beginning, which you can do, it just takes, it just takes practice and if that's something you're interested in doing, it will get there. So outlines are handy because it just makes a line in between the two to communicate to your viewer that they're two separate forms or objects or things like that. But it does have a tendency to flatten. So that's why coloring books don't look three-dimensional because they're just outlines. Where when you start to introduce values, which is the lightness and darkness of a color, that's actually how you communicate three-dimensionality on a two-dimensional surface. Okay. Oh, I forgot one little section. That's the beauty of having your paper taped down. And also the beauty of having one of these handy dandy colored markers. Because I could see where I outlined and where I didn't, you know? Okay, let's do our oath. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my promise work. Promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have and fun. I promise to have fun. Thank the timing you. was off, I'm sorry. That's okay. I always want to get it like right when you hit peak thumb, <laughs> you know? Okay, so we're going to start with the light wash on our flowers and our stems. Now you can see here that my right daffodil, I went with more of a yellow orange, like that buttercup color. And then on my left one, I actually wanted the petals to be more white and the center one to be yellow. Does that communicate in the, okay, wonderful. So for my right daffodil, I'm just gonna take a little bit of lemon yellow and a little bit of tiger orange and mix that together. Add water to that mixture so it's a light value. And I'm just gonna do a light wash across the entire thing. And make sure it's a light wash. You, 
You want this to be almost like a barely there color. If it's too dark, then um, we won't have the highlights that we need in order to make this feel like it actually has form. While you're watching, you got a favorite flower? Yes. Please enlighten us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, it's a poppy. It's called like a sunny side, sunny sunny side egg poppy. I think yeah, is the nickname awesome. for it. I also really love ranunculus. We saw those poppies up by Fort Bragg, right? Is that mm -hmm. what those were? Mm -hmm. yeah. They kind of grow on a. Oh my gosh! Now I'm totally blanking. You know those really stalky. Mm -hmm. flowers that your mom grows hollyhock hollyhock it reminded me of a hollyhock yeah uh, shape. I'm going to do a light yellow wash across the center of this flower since I want that to be yellow and you could just do the whole thing and I'm just using my round six for this because I'm just trying to fill up space okay and now we're gonna move on to our white petals and this is where it just gets a little bit tricky because when we think of white petals, when we're thinking of painting white, especially with watercolor, we get kind of frozen because we're like, wait a second, the paper is white. How do I paint white to show that it's actually there? And one thing is that a lot of times white is not actually white. If you hold up like a white printer paper to a white flower, to the white of your eyes, to your teeth, <laughs> you'll see that what you think is white is not actually white. It's, it's cream or it's gray or there are undertones of other colors. So you have to pay attention to what those undertones are. Um, and it depends on what it is and that will inform you. Where like for me, for these white petals, I decided to go undertones of yellow because there's yellow around it and a little bit of green. So, um, what you want to do is you grab a little bit of yellow and then I'm going to try and mix like a tiny bit of green. So I'm going to grab some blue and yellow here. And I'm going to add water to that so it's a barely there green. And I'm going to grab a little bit of yellow to warm it up. And it, can you see how light this value is? Yeah. I mean, it's barely, it's barely there, you guys we want to be working in such a light value to begin, okay? So using this color, I'm not gonna paint the entire thing. I'm going to start by kind of following if you have your outline still. And you can just pull this up beside you if that's helpful. Kind of look at where I have some of these hash marks. So I'm kind of just doing like half of a petal at a time. I okay. love plants so much. Yeah, they are beautiful. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing with my stems. And then this one I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to allow myself to do a little bit of a darker value for the green than what I did for my um, petals. So I'm mixing together green, I mix some yellow into it to make it nice and warm. Add some water to it so it's a lighter value. And that might be too dark. And if you put down a color and it's too dark, don't stress. Just spread it around using just water. Or you could always grab your paper towel and kind of like lift up, lift up any extra color. But at this point, we're just kind of doing a light wash across the whole thing. It's been a while, but I think daffodil stems are hollow. They're like a straw. That sounds right, but I'm not sure. I feel like it's been a long time since I've actually like touched a daffodil.
Back to favorite flowers. I used to say columbines, and if you haven't seen a columbine, they're unbelievably gorgeous. But lately, I think what excites me more is wisteria. Ooh, wisteria is so beautiful. It's like drapey purple curtains of flowers, and I think it's it's peak beauty. Yeah. Okay, we did step one and two. Good job, you guys. We're going to move on to step three. And at this point, do not judge your painting because you're probably looking at your painting being like, I'm sorry, what is this? Don't worry, it will get there. We haven't put it in the values yet. There's no dimension yet, so don't give up. Okay, so we're gonna move on and we're gonna do our medium values. So what that means is this is where you're gonna look at your picture and say, okay, I see my highlights on my petals. Where do I see, starting to see some darker values? And what, and you can go off your outline, you can go off your reference photo. I'm gonna switch to my round two. And I'm gonna mix together a warmer yellow. Cause here's the thing you guys, when it comes to value, you can adjust the value by hue or by how much paint you're using with watercolor. Cause watercolor, how you get a lighter value is you add more water. That will naturally make a lighter value because it's almost like adding white, okay? So then if you want a dark value by just adjusting your amount of water, you would basically be using just paint and very little water. And that could be a way to communicate a dark value on your painting. Or if you start to introduce another hue, that can communicate a darker value as well. So instead of me just using pure yellow, for the darker values on my daffodil, I'm gonna mix a little bit of orange, and then on my very last step, I'm gonna mix a tiny bit of red in there, because then I'm going even darker than the yellow hue allows by introducing other hues into that value change. Does that make sense? Totally. Okay, so, and for me, um, I like to do value, uh, ranges that are adjusted by hue because I feel like it adds richness because you're adding in all of these colors but I don't always do it and it's not always necessary I just want to let you guys know that there's a couple ways that you can do it okay so now I have this really warm yellow by mixing together my yellow and my orange and then kind of where these petals are coming out And what I like to do too, is I like to put these colors in and then I rinse my brush and I like to like blend and transition them. Can we pull your paper down just a little bit? Absolutely. Perfect. And the reason why I'm doing this kind of blending and transitioning is because I want this to feel like natural transitions. I don't want it to totally feel um, like color blocked. Already, already I see form, you know what I mean? I think daffodils remind me of Alice in Wonderland. Oh yeah. Daffodils just remind me of spring. I mean, like it, they just scream like April to me. I wonder if you can eat them. I'm gonna look it up. Okay. Now when we get to like the cup part, like this the cup shape on our daffodil. I'm gonna put some darker value on the base here. And then the left hand lip gets a darker value. And then for the right hand side, it's not the lip, it's where that lip turns into like the bowl kind of curve in there. 
like so. And then blend it out. Okay, all you llamas out there, do not eat daffodils. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't eat daffodils. They're not good for you. They will not be good for you. And if you eat the like bulb part underground, I, I think it could kill you. Okay, good to know. Well, don't eat plants just that you don't know about unless you research them, right? Okay, so we did our medium value on our right daffodil. We're going to do the same on our left. Now using um, that same warm color, I'm going to do the center. Okay, so we did, we just finished the medium values on our right daffodil, and I just want to call attention to, I have two different positions here on my daffodil, which I wanted to show you how to do it two different ways. This one is more straight on, this one is turned. And I just want to give you guys a heads up that painting anything straight on, animals, pets, flowers, anything with form, it's much harder to communicate that depth and form when it's straight on then when it's turned to the side because of foreshortening and how our mind works is our brain has ideas of how things are and the look of them in our brain and so then when we try and communicate that onto a two-dimensional surface that's where proportions can get kind of funky because our brain is just like a hand is a hand i know that a hand looks like this but are we on front facing camera if this is my hand straight up that's great if i put it straight on towards you like this my hand went from six inches tall to like a half an inch or an inch tall and our brain is like wait hands aren't half an inch tall and then it gets really tricky to communicate and that's the same so if you're looking at a flower and it's turned to the side our brain is like okay i see that form i see that flower when it's straight on it's like oh i got to communicate that depth and that form still even though it's like facing me does that make sense? Totally. Okay. So I painted the center of this and then I'm going to go along the edge and just kind of where it kind of turns in a little bit is where I'm going to put this darker value or medium value, I should say. And then I'm just going to blend it out. Okay. Now I'm going to do... Um, the darker, the medium value on my white petals. Now this is where I'm gonna introduce some neutrals. I want it to be a little bit more gray than yellow or green. So I'm gonna to mix together azure, rose red, and some orange. And just kinda of keep adding different colors until you get more of like a gray. Now this is a brown, but it's reading as a neutral brown to me which means it's not super warm, and that's what I'm going for. And to get more of a neutral brown, just keep adding like blue instead of yellow. So now I have this like brown gray color. And using that brown gray color, I'm gonna follow that same idea where, where these petals are coming out of the center is where I'm gonna start putting in my dark values. And I always like to paint a couple and then rinse my brush and blend. Now, if you like to take your time with painting and don't paint as fast as I do, which is totally normal and okay, you might wanna do one petal at a time because the longer you let something sit on your paper and dry, the harder it is to blend it out. Push that paper back up a smidge, please. Thank you. Is that better? Yep. Concerning the eating of wild plants, I've just been thinking about this this whole time because I'm weird. Uh, I love mushrooms and I got really into kind of like learning about what wild, mu wild mushrooms you can pick and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I read a bunch of books and it kind of turns out that like the more you know about mushrooms, the less inclined you want to eat wild ones <laughs> yeah. because like there's such a high chance that it's a bad one. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's like that about plants too. It's like, well, I could try it or 
I'll just get something at the store. Yeah. I think it's crazy how many different shades are in that one. Hues. How many different hues? Sorry. Hues. Yeah, different colors going on. Okay. So we did our medium value on our petal part. Now we're going to move on to our stems. So I'm going to mix together a darker green using blue, and you can use orange or yellow. They're both really warm, so they'll they'll do the they'll get the job done. And then I'm going to mix just a tiny bit of red into this to desaturate my greens. Okay, so using this medium value, I'm going to look at where there are darker values, specifically where the stem meets the flower, because the flower is casting a shadow onto that stem on both of them. And then also we can see that some of our stems are kind of turning. So we want to show like this is one side and then it kind of turns and we see the under part too and then that is, it continues to go. Does that see, do you see that? Do you guys see that? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put in this value and then of course rinse your brush and blend it out you guys so it's not too chunky. I just thought of another project that like if you like outlines and structure would be a good one to begin with. What? Um, I think people, I'm trying to, I'm thinking back to um, where I see people felt successful in a project and I feel like the flamingo with the floral crown, that one I think I saw a lot of success with that and also the giraffe. Um, Both classics. Yeah, harder ones that do have outlines, you know, obviously like the eyes is really difficult. And I actually did a sunflower that did not have an outline. I've done two sunflowers now, but the first one I did, that one was really hard. <laughs> so like if you tried that one and you struggled with it, totally understandable. That was actually a really tricky one. Um, I feel like there's another one that I had. I, I don't know. It's also, I will say that even me just answering this, this question of difficulty, I, I am nervous to answer it just because I, I know that we all learn different ways and have different tendencies. And I'm afraid that like what I consider maybe more straightforward or easy might not be that to you. And I don't want that to discourage you from thinking that you can't do this. So that's why I, I'm always a little bit nervous, I guess, to, to answer that question simply because I view things that are loose as more easy because that is my tendency. That's how I like to paint. So I don't fight against that. Where if that is not your tendency and you do not like to paint that way, then like that advice is not helpful to you. <laughs> so in a nutshell, difficulty is relative. Yes. Yeah, I mean, for the most part. What a weird saying in a nutshell is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm also putting in some darker values on the base of my uh, stems here and just kind of blending up. And I'm still using a two. If you want to use a six, you can. I wonder if also difficulty is determined by like detail, you know? Yeah. Well, that's what I was curious about steps because like maybe there's, you know, 10 steps because the whole paper is filled up, but kind of just like keeping track of doing those in the right order or like the stress of that. I don't, I wanted you to reassure people that maybe that wasn't difficult, mm. especially if you have a guide, you know? Yeah. I'm feeling pretty good about where this is going. Now at this point, you should start to feel a little bit more dimension with your daffodils. This should feel different than when we finished step one and two, okay? So now we're moving on to step four, which is our darkest values. 
And I just want to point out that also when you're painting realistically, I personally have a tendency to go with saturated colors. I love vibrant colors. That's why I love liquid watercolors because they're dye based. So you get that vibrancy and I'm all about that. However, usually when you're painting things realistically, you're not going to see such vibrancy. There is always sometimes a little bit of desaturation, especially when it comes to like creams and yellows and things like that in nature. So for my daffodil, this is looking really vibrant. It's looking great, but if we're trying to paint this realistically, I have to tone down some of these yellows and these oranges so then it's not like vibrant in your face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I still have this brown, and I'm gonna add a little bit of red to that and a little bit of yellow and orange. So it's kind of like a dark orange brownish color and we're gonna see how that looks with our, yeah, there we go, that feels a little bit more. Do you wanna pull that back down a little bit? Yeah, thank we're you. We're just for... flipping back and forth between the two flowers. Okay. And then even after you put it down, I still want you guys to blend out. And I might even, I think I might cool off this brown even a little bit more. Try and neutralize it by adding complementary colors back and forth. That's still too brown. For those of you who are brand new, how do you find a complementary color? What's the easiest way, Sarah? The easiest way to, is to make a, a six section color wheel, put in the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Whatever is across from each other on the color wheel is its complement. Red and green, blue and orange, yellow and purple. So if something is feeling too green, add red to tone down that green. If something's feeling too purple, add yellow to, to, to um, um, Turn it down. Tone. <laughs> turn it down. Turn turn that down. I wonder why they call it a compliment. Because it's like the opposite of that. Well, actually, it is. Even though you can utilize those complementary colors to tone them down, you can also use them next to each other mm -hmm. to hype each other up. So, like, oranges and, and uh, blues next to each other, they make those colors pop when they're next to each other, which you can utilize. So they do complement because they make the other one stand out when they're next to each other. But you mix them together to tone them down. That's a juicy nugget of information. Good job. Thank you. Let's do an old classic, Sarah. Yeah. Who has the best nuggets? Chicken nuggets? Yeah. From fast food? Yeah. Um, well, I'm a Wendy's gal myself. But probably, well, okay. You guys want to know something about me? The reason why I say Wendy's is because I have a severe love of dipping my chicken nuggets into their chocolate frosties and eating them that way. So that's why I love Wendy's chicken nuggets because I dip them with my frosties. But if I do not have a frosty to dip, then I would probably say Chick-fil-A. Um, and does chicken tenders count? Or no, we're just nuggets, doing nuggets? nuggets. Then I, I would, would almost even disbar Chick-fil-A because those are real chicken. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just talking about like the ground up shaped little nuggets you know yeah what do you think i don't know i'm a mcdonald's guy i love the crisp on them yeah uh sarah loves those wendy's frosties so much i got her a little keychain that lets her get a free mini one every time she goes it's through a drive through <laughs> it's true it's on my keychain <laughs> wendy's are just soggy sometimes better flavor 
worst texture. That's fair. I have had an undercooked chicken nugget before, though, and it, it ruined me for a bit. Ooh, that does not sound like, like a good time. Michael. Okay, all right. Sick. Okay. And then now we're going to do the bottom of the kind of cup here. your least favorite flower you got a least favorite nope I feel oh. like you do and you just don't want to offend somebody oh I just did another wash on my yellow that kind of turned it green a little bit which if that happens to you not a huge deal I just lifted up that color and then I'm going to grab more of the yellow and the orange and just do a wash over it how did that happen um, I just had a little bit too much azure on uh, my color mixture. And then if you layer azure on top of your yellow, it's going to turn green. Michael, you're like, how did you do? Why did you do that? <laughs> Is. Really? I don't know. I think they're funky shaped. I think our, I, we had this neighbor in California, the Wileys, who I love very much. They're really close family friends of ours, but um, they, they have this gorgeous garden. And one day, the, uh, one of the family members, Elizabeth, she dropped off this iris on my porch that was like blush. And it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. I couldn't get over how gorgeous it was. So I think like sometimes irises, they're just, I love the flowiness of their petals. I also love the yellow next to the per. Okay, I'm a, I like irises. <laughs> <laughs> they're not my favorite, but I really think they're beautiful. I think, I think sometimes I have a hard time with carnations mm. because I feel like they're so, um, structured like they're like at attention you know what I mean like the shape of them and um, I, I think I really like my flowers to be like flowy and I was roughly. just giggling about the Wileys Sarah because if you think about the Wileys and the Crays hanging out it seems like uh, mischief Wiley yeah. and Cray <laughs> Okay, ooh, that daffodil's looking good. I love thistle flowers. Those big purple ones out here in the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm, I do. Those are beautiful. Those okay. plants are a nightmare, though. They're like spiky death traps. Okay, I'm feeling good about my right daffodil. I'm gonna move on to my left. And I'm gonna do my petals first instead of the center and still kind of mixing just a darker value. See if you can get a neutral, but a warm neutral. So mix some yellow or orange into there. And again, kind of more following where it's coming out of the center and if you I like to blend out my values but if you have a hard time where every time you blend out your values you end up losing your value because you blend it out so much well then maybe try and see doing a layer where you don't blend out and just leaving that dark see what that does if that helps I 
I'm just thinking about last names now. It's kind of fun, you know? They all started somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like Wiley. What? <laughs> yeah. Like, now they? that means, like, crazy. Like a, like a Wiley kid, right? Mm-hmm. I wonder how that, like, surname came to be. Well, if there's any Wileys watching. Yeah, right in. Let us know. Okay, so I'm adding kind of a darker value along the edge here. And then going into the center. The outer ring here is going to have a darker value. So. And then on the inside, it's gonna be like a really dark brown, but please leave like a little bit of a white space for like the stamen. Oh my gosh, well done. Just throwing stamen out casually. <laughs> Thank you. And then we're gonna go to our um, stems. So I'm feeling really good about the values I have going on on my stems, but I will say that where I put my light value, my first layer, I want it to be warmer. I feel like that green is a little bit too cool. So I'm just gonna grab some yellow and do a yellow wash on top. And maybe yours can be opposite. Maybe yours is too yellow and you're like, man, that's just like yellow. I want it to be green. Well then do like a green or a blue wash on top. Okay, Wiley is from Old English. It means willow. Means willow? Yeah. Mm. In case you're curious, all you listeners out there, all you cats and kittens, uh, cray is a little type of creek. That's why those like little freshwater lobsters are called crayfish. Mm -hmm. A little creek. And if you guys are feeling a little bit lost, we're basically just repeating that first two steps over and over again. That's pretty much all it is. So um, we're putting in, we're just kind of building up our values and adjusting them a little bit by hue as we build. Okay, that feels better to me, it's warmer. And then I'm gonna go in and do another dark value where there's like that shadow. So right as it's coming out. See how much that pushed that, that stem back in space? Totally. So cool. And then on some of the, I'm just kind of blending just a little bit, not too much. good. My stems feel good. I love these greens that I'm getting here. And then if your greens are feeling a little bit too saturated, you can always mix a little bit of red in there, tone down that green. And I think I'm going to do, and we're on our very last step. So this is where we've put in our dark values. Hopefully they've had a little bit of time to dry to give you an idea of how they kind of ended up because your painting changes as it dries. 
especially in watercolor. And then kind of see if there's any other like last minute adjustments you need to make. I feel like this petal, my right hand petal here, it needs to be a little bit darker because this cup part is coming out over it, which means it would have like a stronger shadow on it. Pull it down a smidge. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my voice is going too. And then also, I know that we put in our highlight already, but like, if you're like, okay, I want this to feel more yellow though, you could just do another yellow wash on some of these areas, especially on like some of the lighter values where it will like pop and show up. Now, do I think you should cover the whole thing? No, because I think those like barely there colors act as a really great highlight, which helps with form and dimension. But if you want to add a little bit more yellow to your daffodil or orange, you can. And the reason why I always kind of leave these tightening details as almost like a loose last step is because I can't see your guys' painting, only you can see your painting. And maybe you don't need to be doing the things that I'm doing because maybe your or earlier layers were more yellow or darker or any of those things. So just because I'm doing it on my paper, that doesn't mean you have to do it if your painting doesn't need it. And then if you wanna do a couple little like text, like, um, I say texture lines, but you know how petals have those kinds of little lines in there, almost where they fold in or something? If you wanna put a couple of those in there, you can. And same thing for our left hand flower here, our straight on daffodil. I just kind of want to make this yellow just a little bit more saturated. Not a ton, just a little. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And this is where it's also super helpful to maybe take a step back and look at your painting. See how the values are reacting to each other. See the color, see the form, see if there's anything you need to change. But mine's done. It's beautiful. Gosh, I love how this turned out. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I hope that this is a way to get into that spring mood. I'm so excited for the flowers to come out and ready to see some daffodils popping up along our, in our yard. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can share your work. We have a Facebook group that's for the sole purpose of you guys sharing. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. We have an Instagram where you can tag us at Let's Go Make Art or hashtag Let's Make Art. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. That's it. Michael, thank you for being here. Thank you. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.